Here's five twin engine aircraft you've probably never heard of. Number one. Lithuania is not exactly known for their aviation history. However, one man single-handedly did his best to put Lithuania on the aviation map. His name was Vladis Kenzgaila. Over the years, Kenzgaila proved himself a prolific designer, having created around eight different prototypes between sailplanes, trainers, and crop dusters, of which none ever developed beyond the prototype stage. Ken Skyla decided he needed to go big or go home. The VK-9 was an ambitious project and considered the very first passenger aircraft design in Lithuania. The VK-9 initially was to be powered by a single M14P radial with 360 horsepower, a very common choice for power in Easter Bloc countries. But Ken Skyla decided to enlarge the cabin and redesign it into a twin, making it more attractive to buyers as it would offer more flexibility. Kenzgaila began development in 1990 and the VK-9 twin first flew in 2009. The VK-9 was proclaimed by its owner to be vastly superior to any equivalent Western offerings by Cessna or Piper. With its sights on international orders, it was powered by Western built 250 horsepower Lycomings with cowlings looking suspiciously similar to the Aztecs. Featuring twin main wheels, the VK-9 was designed for rugged runways, could seat up to 8, and had an impressive range of 1,500 nautical miles. Mr. Kenzgaila also made some bold claims that a German group was interested in producing the VK-9 and was ready to buy the rights of the aircraft. But the prototype required more flight testing, and furthermore, Kenzgaila felt the Germans weren't ready for his advanced design. The VK-9 was a mixed construction design with a metal frame covered in fiberglass. Kinskyla tried to drum up investors for his ambitious design, but found no interest, so he decided to donate the twin to a museum for a static display. At least, that's what he led people to believe. Sadly, that was never to be. As a VK-9 crash landed following a stall near an airport and was written off, the VK-9 had not been authorized to fly and the 82-year-old designer pilot's certificate had long expired. Thankfully, Kenzgaila was only lightly injured and fined a few hundred euros for his foolish act. The VK-9 was lightly damaged, but no longer airworthy, and eventually did find its way to the museum, where it's now on static display. Number 2 The British Speed Twin E2E Comet 1 was a small twin with a comically long name and a sadly short production life. It was purpose built to answer the question no one asked, why can't we have an aerobatic twin? And reportedly the only civil twin ever certified for intentional spins. Try that in your baron. Speed Twin construction began in 1981 and finally taking flight in 1991. This version featured 100 horsepower Continentals fixed gear with spats from a chipmunk, and wings borrowed from a Victor Air Tour. The basic version flew for 10 years and was damaged in a taxi accident. A new Speed Twin was built, this time with Avia M332 inline-4 engines. This model looked quite handsome, the inline engine reminiscent to British twins from the 1930s. Later, during its development, it was upgraded yet again, with Titan Lycoming IO390s with 205 horsepower, essentially doubling the original horsepower. This was in part to improve single engine capabilities by providing an extra margin for safety. Its new owner's Speed Twin Developments even had plans for a turboprop model and a fully armed military version. Pretty ambitious for a plane to start out as a small twin you could toss around a bit. The E2E in the name stands for Engineer to Excel. Originally planned to be sold as a kit plane, Speed Twin Developments eventually withdrew those plans, aiming for a much wider market. Speed Twin also touted the aircraft's strengths and durability, claiming it could operate from short, unprepared runways. With its new light combings, it could climb at 2,000 feet per minute, even with fixed pitch props. Their website claimed a takeoff distance of only 100 meters while carrying a payload of 1,000 pounds. It appeared the Speed Twin could do everything. 
As much as Speed Twin promoted the aircraft for a wide variety of missions, what they were truly aiming for was a lucrative multi-engine trainer market for flight schools around the world. Here was a product you could safely take students up and provide upset prevention and recovery training with lessened dangers of entering an unrecoverable stall, an event which sadly has cost many pilots their lives. Their original target price was around 500000 which is quite optimistic given that most twins are going for a million and up. Though a rather pleasing design to look at and looking somewhat like a cross between an RV-8 and a Zenith with twin motors, unfortunately only two prototypes have been produced and it did not achieve EASA certification in Europe. As of yet, the company found no investors interested in their amazing twin and no orders were placed either. Number 3 the Rockwell Fuji Commander 700 was a large twin designed by Fuji Industries in Japan and assembled in the U.S. by Rockwell. Fuji was looking to diversify its offerings and venture into corporate aviation. The resulting design was nearly as large as a King Air with a pressurized cabin, a distinct cruciform tail, and a commanding ram presence. Rockwell partnered with Fuji with the commitment of final assembly and marketing the 700 in the U.S. As a compromise, Rockwell also shut down production of its own large piston twin, the Commander 685, which the 700 replaced. It's no coincidence it was named the Commander 700. It was definitely an odd duck for a company who up to that point offered a full line of high wing twins for so many years. With the 700, Rockwell had ambitions of developing the 700 into a turboprop and even a jet version. With an air stair door, it was truly a luxurious cabin class twin, listed at 260,000 in 1978. A pressurization system allowed its passengers to fly in comfort at 20,000 feet. As such, the 700 was well built and robust, as a result, very heavy which ultimately became its downfall. The Achilles heel of the 700 was severely inadequate power, supplied by two 340 horsepower Lycomings featuring distinctive P-51-like air scoops. The 700 was clearly underpowered and range was short at gross weight. As a result, the market answered and sales were poor. Then Fuji responded and rolled out a version with 450 horsepower. It was too little and too late, as Rockwell Aviation sold off their general aviation division to focus solely on military equipment, and their agreement with Fuji was terminated. And thus, production ended in 1978, with only 29 aircraft delivered after a four-year production run. A handful are still flying around the world, and reportedly their owners are quite happy with the large cabin and relatively reliable systems. On the other hand, Finding parts for the Orphan 700 is nearly impossible. Number 4 The Dornier DO-27 from Germany was a single-engine post-war stall aircraft. Bearing a resemblance to the Helio Courier, it also shared a similar mission. With its rugged design and highly capable of operating anywhere, about 550 units were produced and saw operation well into the 1980s. Dornier then engineered a solution for those who needed the redundancy of an extra engine and reworked the DO-27 into a twin model. While most manufacturers would have opted for the most obvious choice of attaching the engines on the wings, Dornier thought well outside the box and went for a unique approach never seen before. Using short, stubby wings, they attached the engines directly onto the fuselage. This configuration offered many advantages. On most twins, losing an engine on takeoff spells a death sentence due to the asymmetrical thrust. The DO-28 mitigates this issue by placing the engines close together. Additionally, it made the wings lighter and cut out the engineering time and costs required to build new wings and jigs for the DO-28. A beneficial byproduct of this design was the broader wheel track, providing superior stability on the ground when compared to the narrower wheel stance of the DO-27. And lastly, the engines were close to the ground for easy maintenance. Retaining the overall design elements from the DO-27, Dornier removed the engine from the nose, replacing it with a large, rounded nose bowl. This helped increase the cockpit space and legroom. The DO-28 featured seating for six, a pilot
pilot and co-pilot in the front with a club style seating arrangement with two bench seats in the back. To help balance out the extra weight of the twin engines, the wingspan was extended by 5 feet contributing to an increased payload capacity of 700 pounds over the single engine DO-27. The DO-28 was offered in two variants. The base model A powered by 250 horsepower Lycoming 0540s and the upgraded B model boasting fuel injection and 290 horsepower. Typical of aircraft in the 1950s, the DO-28 was equipped with exhaust augmenters, producing a healthy bark during takeoff. Currently, only three DO-28As remain airworthy, two of them residing at the same airport in Wisconsin. Dornier saw great potential in the DO-28 and designed a completely new aircraft called the DO-28 Sky Serpent. This one bore very little resemblance to the DO 28AB with a large boxy fuselage that could carry 13 passengers, but it did retain the twin engines on the nose. Dornier borrowed the Sky Service fuselage and built it into a small turboprop powered commuter, which then became the Dornier 228. It's a pretty amazing evolution to think that what started out as this ended up as this. Number 5. This is the elegant BM-11 Southern Air, a post-war executive twin. If the Southern Air looks remarkably like a Grumman Widgeon, well, it's because it started out as a Widgeon. Southern aircraft was formed by Luxcom employees shortly before World War II and initially produced a biplane named the BM-10. They also tried to market a rotable plane named the Rotable, but that effort flopped. Southern's main revenue was sourced from building components from for other manufacturers during World War II, such as gun turrets. Immediately following the war, Southern wanted to join the civilian aviation scene, an era we now know as the post-war boom, and their entry was a BM-11 Southern Air. Having produced components for Grumman during World War II, the company was highly interested in the Grumman Widgeon Amphibian and its potential as a light corporate transport. The Southern Air was essentially a chopped up Widgeon with its seaplane hull smoothed over, a larger cabin, and a modern tricycle landing gear. It could accommodate six passengers in luxurious comfort. It was originally to be powered with 270 horsepower geared like homings, but those weren't available by the time the airframe was built, so they retained the original 200 horsepower Rangers from the Widgeon. The Southern Air looked pretty good and had potential, however, found itself in the same predicament as countless other innovative designs in the post-war era. The market was flooded with surplus aircraft which fulfilled the same mission at a fraction of the cost. It was much cheaper to convert a Beach 18 from war fatigues to an executive suit than purchase a brand new aircraft that covered essentially the same mission. It was yet another victim of being built at the wrong time. At the very least, Southern Air could claim a spot in the very small list of aircraft that used to be amphibians and were converted to land planes.